part five, Fulgrim. I'm intrigued if this is a continuation from the previous book, or if we're moving into the fleshing out the Primarchs and checking out all the other bits of the heresy that are going on. Whatever it is, I'm going in. First, we've got a new narrator. This guy sounds a bit of a lovey. Unlike the others, this dude sounds like he's been treading the balls and belting out some shake. And everybody knows what Shakespeare is crap. Yes. <laughs> no, well, yes, 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 yes. What is the good thing about Shakespeare? You see, Edwin, Shakespeare being a genius. It's allowed slightly more license when us less immortal. It opens with a few quotes about seeking perfection, and if you aim high, hitting the mark, and all that sort of stuff. And there's this group of artists, and one Ostian Delafour. Just got this slab of marble from Terra, and that the Emperor's request is about to start work, and he's about to make those first all-important cuts. I've read about this in other sources, how some sculptors and other artists view the creative process. The art is already there, you just have to bring it out. The statue is already in the slab, it just has to be freed. The blank canvas, is it going to release a stick figure or a smiley face or a Boris Vallejo or an HR Geiger? There's this lady, Serena DeAngelis, who is trying to do a portrait in there as well, and they're having a bit of banter. Why does he keep his workplace so untidy while she keeps her so immaculate? It's really weird because it's like we're not in a Warhammer book right now. It's just everyday discussion and back and forth between some artists. They're also detailing appearance and clothing. She wears a bit too much makeup. Her basque is a bit too much. They studied music at some swanky place and had all these tutors. And art is the most important thing. And Astartes comes in and he's a patron of the arts. It's really kind of disconcerting. I mean, you normally think of patrons of the arts as some dozy scumbag billionaire or industrialist looking to polish up their image after fucking people over for a few decades. I could be a philanthropist, a kick-ass philanthropist. I would have all this money and, and people would love me. Then they would come to me and beg. And if I felt like it, I would help them out and then they would owe me big time. Anyways, it's like there isn't even a crusade on, no alien menace. I guess like in the 1940s, there may be a war on, but there's still art to be made. So Fulgrim is coming in to sit for a portrait, and this is really weird. So far, everything revolves around war. The reclamation of humanity into a single Imperium, everything exists to fuel the war machine, either through weapons, ships, even cranking out Astartes. Bullets, bandages, and beans win wars, not flattering portraiture. Agri-worlds supply food, forge worlds make stuff, Mars provides weapons, even hive worlds supply bodies to throw into the meat grinder. So to see all of that not even mentioned as we have this kind of high culture discussion, artists questioning their abilities, should I start again? No, don't question yourself, you are excellent. Why is she so interested in me? I can't stand her. Popularity and relationship hassles and culture shenanigans in the grim dark of the far future. Because you see, that was an actual problem. And um, yours is just like, you know, a bunch of, you know, high school crap that nobody really gives you. you know. <laughs> and there's this renowned performer, Bekwa Kinska. She's supposedly showing up and it's, I don't know what the big deal is. I've heard her recordings and shame all that. But the rebuttal is, unless you've heard her in person, you don't know Jack. And bring a hanky because you'll be moved to tears. And there's all these captains and nobles and military turning up. It's like a swanky USO show, or taking in a tour of the Louvre while on leave in Paris in World War II. In the other books, everything is about the crusade. It's the sole focus of everyone, even the remembrances. They live and breathe it, trying to capture it for posterity. Whereas here, it's just a romp. Oh, let's dilly-dally through the galaxy, reuniting humanity, work on our art projects, have a few drinks, a few laughs, the odd dinner party with the Primarch, and it'll be a jolly fine time. Dude, what am I reading? I'm a chapter in and there hasn't been a single bolt round. When are they gonna get to the fireworks factory?
Anyways, so there was apparently a near catastrophic event in the Emperor's children's past, where they were almost wiped out. Not only did most of their gene seed get destroyed, but some viral blight swept through the rest. So, as they were slowly being repopulated, they were alongside the War Master who was trying to help them rebuild. So, for about a century, the Emperor's children were fighting alongside the Lunar Wolves. Well, maybe not alongside because they were such a small fighting force, but helping out as best they could. I still think Horus's turn to chaos was a little on the quick side, but this set some more solid foundations for the fall of the Third Legion. They are used to being side by side with the Lunar Wolves, used to following the War Master, so even without Fulgrim, they'd likely go along with the Heresy probably just out of habit. Anywho, the Lunar Wolves were kind of like training wheels, keeping the Legion going as they slowly rebuilt their numbers, which was greatly accelerated when they finally found Fulgrim. And when they are up to full strength, off come the water wings and paddling out onto the crusade they go. And it also helps reinforce the quest for perfection thing. They were almost made extinct. They had to be coddled by another legion. That's a big shadow to have lived under. I mean, once they are back at full strength, I can see them never, ever wanting to be seen as weak or in need of protection again. Best way for that to go down? Be the best. Be perfect. Be unstoppable. It even makes all the tinkering with gene seed far more plausible. When Fabius started messing with them, I was a little dubious that they'd accept this so readily, but now I can see that having been brought low to the very verge of annihilation, especially as they had no Primark either like the other legions, they would be willing to do the unthinkable to ensure it never happens again. Nice bit of plot there. So, the Emperor's Wee Ones are tangling with the Lair. Not big on numbers, but they have high tech. Their weapons fire this green stuff that can punch through Ceramite. Oh no, you did not shoot that green shit at me! They are also listening in on their Vox channels, so much so that this captain has stopped wearing his helmet so he can issue commands verbally without being listened in on. His reasoning is that if he gets shot, helmet or no, he's just as dead. There are these coral atolls that float in the sky, and these are priority targets so the Mechanicum can get their pincers on them and find out how they work. Now, on the topic of remembrances, some legions don't really care for them, others flat out don't want them. Some, like the Lunar Wolves, see their use and tolerate them, but Fulgrim is totally into them being here. They are, after all, writers, artists, they are in effect his peeps. Battle ensues, and then more stuff with the artists. The amazing opera lady tries to get it on with this kid, and he's not having any of it. And of course, she gets bent out of shape from having been spurned, and starts plotting vengeance. From Volta Fire to Soap Opera. So, they are scavenging layered corpses and studying them and finding out that they are being modified to suit their assigned function. Warrior, laborer, diplomat. Each is changed to better suit their role in society, getting closer to perfection, as Fabius puts it. Fulgrim questions Fabius if he considers these things perfect, because we, the Emperor's creations, are a perfection. How can these Xenos beasties be perfect? And Fabius puts his life on the line here by suggesting that even though they are top tier, they could still do with a little bit of a buff. After all, weren't we almost wiped out? Was that an accident or a lack of perfection? We are called the Emperor's children. Maybe we need to grow up, learn to walk on our own as we become adults. Not sure that's quite as catchy a Legion name though. The Emperor's dudes? The Emperor's bras? The Emperor's chads? So, here we see Fulgrim go from the stance of tinkering with gene seed is on par with vaping life eater virus, so hmm, you make a good point, let's give it a go. They were down to less than 200 Astartes at one point. If they take a few more steps towards perfection, even by cheating, it'll ensure that that never happens again. Then, they are having a meeting, banter ensues, it's round table to erase rank, but Fulgrim arrives and it's clear who is the head honcho. A, because he's a few feet taller than anyone else, and B, because even a huge hall feels cramped when there is a Primarch in it. Such is the aura they exude. I've said it before, but again, this eases my doubt over Horus's treachery. If a room feels swollen from a Primarch, 
Imagine the Emperor's presence. And if he's suddenly not there, it's like when Christie is succumbing to hell in What Dreams May Come. That room will suddenly start to feel barren, sucked dry, hollowed out, shadows lengthening, and you you grow, you'd feel deserted, even betrayed, as just darkness swells around you from the absence. Ritual and tradition is important to the Legion, repetition being key in the quest for perfection. It's like that quote from Vidal Sassoon, or Aristotle, or whoever. You know, the excellence one. And so, the opera singer is still brooding about the kid rejecting her, and while he may not have been Captain Stud Muffin, he was at least young and innocent, and she craves the adoration of the young. And why? Because ruining innocence is one of the last pleasures she has left. Jesus, what a fucking bitch! This is like that douche at the start of Hellraiser 3, adore me or else. And also, I get off on hurting people who adore me. First, just psychologically. And I wonder if she's going to follow JP Monroe's path and move the abuse into the physical. So, unlike the other books, there's this Lair fight scene. That just keeps going on and on and on. There's musing, but it's just a really long ruck. Other books use the fights to get a point across. They serve the purpose. This doesn't really have the same effect. Maybe because it's hard to live up to what went before, first of all with Horus and Loken and the Mega Arachnid and then Garrow and the lads and the bottleship. Those were some very vibrant characters. So maybe I'm just falling into the Horus thing I was just talking about. The previous books were concerning Primarchs and the great Astartes, you know, the, the main characters. Now I'm just listening to average grunts who, while bigger than life, just aren't as overwhelming as the others are. So, Fulgrim wasn't a fan of Terminator armor when it first appeared, finding it so inelegant and clunky. And then he sees it in battle and is quickly converted. So, they go into this chamber, and it's not a place to worship a deity, but rather to worship this sword. And there's a very Slaanesh or Hellraiser-esque description with the agony of this and the ecstasy of that. So this has gotta be the demon sword that is going to corrupt Fulgrim, not that it's gonna be too long a trek. Like Mortarion in the previous book, his seduction is pretty much gonna be a lateral move. So he snags it. And then we're on with Ferris Manus. They found a bunch of welds and brought the humans back into the fold, but then they encounter these other ships cruising around and it's a race called the Diasporex, who used to be human. They are from Earth, back from the Golden Age, but they tell Ferris to get bent when he offers to relocate them to Imperial Wells, and so now, of course, it's on. And there's a dude who lost his leg against orcs, and his right thing against something else, and he's all stoked to get mechanical replacements because of that weird iron hand sting of the flesh is weak, even the starty's flesh. The blessing of iron is a boon. The Iron Hands are engaged with the main fleet, and they think they have them on the run. But then two of the cruisers peel off and dump these cargo container ships so they can make better speed. And this chump concentrates on the cruisers, and he thinks it's a little sus, but then the cruisers start trying to lose him in the Sun's Corona. An obvious and futile move which baffled Stumpy because he had heard that the Diasporix pilots were wicked smart. Then they start to split up and he goes full power so he can slot between them and give them both a good broadside. How is this guy a captain? This is so obvious. I mean, I get the blessing of iron thing. He's had lots of limb replacement, but did they replace his brain with a cauliflower? And, oh look, suddenly they realize that the containers are in fact one of the oldest and most well-known and most obvious military tactics in history, Trojan horses and they spew out all these fighters and other warships and they get torpedoed. And Ferris is revealed to have quite the temper. He starts to lose it and wants the head of the dip who fell for such an obvious ruse, and lost three ships and didn't take out a single solitary one of the enemy. His equerry reminds him that the dude could still be of use. Not so much if he gets denogonized, so maybe just take his arms. Well, what use would he be without arms? Well, what use would he be without a head? Ferris laughs as this aide manages to talk him down from his dismemberment fantasies. So a really grody thought just occurred to me. The Iron Hands have a boner for mechanical limbs. So when a new shipment occurs, everyone is, what, straight down to the med bay to get a new one? So 
either there's a biohazard waste container just full of amputated space marine limbs, or do they just flush them out of the airlock so a giant cloud of arms and legs goes tumbling off into the vacuum of space? Anywho, for this level of screw up, there has to be a punishment, especially because even when it was occurring, he knew something was up and just charged in anyways. They can't remove him, it demoralized the crew. Really? You know what else demoralizes the crew? Getting your ass kicked because your captain can't spot an obvious trap because he's a gimp. You know what demoralizes even the most loyal Imperial trooper? Trying to breathe a vacuum because your ship has just been torn open in an obvious ambush. But they are just appointing a co-captain. Humiliating gets the point across and keeps an eye on him to make sure he doesn't do anything that retarded again. When Ferris holds his battle meetings, there's no chairs. Everyone just hangs out and can speak freely. He encourages debate and questioning. There's news of the other Primarchs, and everyone is all stoked to hear the others doing so well. So there isn't this we're the best legion mentality that we have seen with the Death Guard and the Emperor's children and the Lunar Wolves. Rather, the Iron Hands have respect for the other legions. They take pride in seeing their brothers doing well, and it also pushes them to do better. It's right and proper to acknowledge the achievements of the other legions, and in turn, these deeds are an inspiration. Nice. So he imparts the news that Rogal Dawn is returning to Terra to help fortify the Imperial Palace. So I assume Garrow has just gotten his busted jaw, and Mercedy has played in the greatest hits of the heresy from her memory spools, or has it? He was on the way back anyways when he got stuck in the warp and the Eisenstein's warp drive detonation is what got him out. The Iron Hands and Ferris are a little bemused because why is a legion almost the equal of their own being extracted from the crusade and returned to earth? The Emperor isn't aware of the heresy as far as I know, so there's a reason he's recalling them. I wonder what it is. I'm assuming it's something more pressing than he wants to, I don't know, make use of Rogel's interior design skills that he picked up while getting his architect's degree. And it shows how the Iron Hands respect their brother Astartes, because they are awesome. If anyone can make the Imperial Palace impregnable, it's Rogel! He and his sons know their stuff all right, they are great and brave, and they're an awesome legion, and there's a respect that I haven't seen in any other legions yet. And not a grudging nod to them doing well, but actual satisfaction in the skills of the other legions. And because they know Ferris is really close to Fulgrim, one of them asks if there is any news of the Third Legion, and Ferris is all like, yes, my friends. They are on their way here now, and everyone is super stoked. The closeness of Fulgrim and Ferris explains why Horus was so pissed when he failed to recruit him, because it should have been a slam dunk. I thought you two were mates. <laughs> so did I. So, Fulgrim is on the way, which is where he'll no doubt be extending the offer of joining Horus. We then get the tale of when they met. They both said they were top dog at crafting stuff and Ferris digs at Fulgrim with jibes like such pasty white hands couldn't craft diddly, not like his awesome metal ones. And so the two young gods stripped to the waist and spent the next three months working the forge. Pausing only to make Rye banter. I'm glad they didn't go into detail. It leaves the banter to my imagination. What I find good-natured ribbing might be cruel verbal abuse to someone else. So whatever you think is fun, brotherly banter, that's the picture you're going down. I hate it when fiction tells you something is the best at something and then shows you it. Like the comedian in It, and when Penn and Teller are on Babylon 5. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure down here. You get a hint of them in the background when they go to the far future, but you don't see the greatest band ever actually play. Whatever you think is the best music ever, that's what you think Wild Stallions sound like. Okay, after taking the scenic route there for a moment, back to the contest to see who is indeed Numero Uno Blacksmith. Ferris Manus makes a monster warhammer that can supposedly level a mountain with a single blow. Getting a little bit grim derp there. Fulgrin makes a sword that burns with the flame of the forge. Both reckon the other weapon is the best, so they trade them out and become best buds. And then we get a nice uplifting moment back in the meeting hall. We have been weak. We haven't been able to defeat ships thousands of years older than ours, piloted by mere mortals. Does anyone know why this is? And someone pipes up, because we can't do this alone. Exactly! 
Just as the Emperor's children are seeking perfection, the Iron Hands are seeking to do away with weakness. But it's not weak to ask for help. What is weak is to pretend that you can do it all alone. That's awesome. I really like the Iron Hands. I was kind of dubious at first with this amputation and mechanical prosthetic fetish, but it's making sense now. And then we're back with the artists. There's an area where they all hang out, and it's not only a place of inspiration, but a hotbed of gossip and rumour as well. So they are getting ready to go down to the surface, and there's a couple of iterators with the Astartes to make sure everyone stays on message. One of them is this amazing beauty with a sultry voice, but she's a woman, she's gorgeous, and she's an iterator. Three solid reasons not to trust her. Ouch! Someone got burned by a pretty face before. But Kinska reminds the lads that just because she's beautiful on the outside doesn't mean she's just as beautiful on the inside. And then the youngster finds out that he can't go down to the surface and why. Because the vicious old bag that he spurned has pulled his papers out of spite. And there's a big huge meeting on the Diasporex problem. And Ferris is getting miffed as Fulgrim shoots down every plan they come up with. Bro, look. Every time we try and engage, they melt away. This straight up the middle shit isn't going to cut it. The reason the aliens are sticking around in system, despite being wicked outnumbered, is that they don't have the fuel to flee. They are harvesting energy from the sun. Ferris is pacing and fuming at the inaction, and grumbles that this doesn't look like a ship of war, more like a gallery. Then he pauses because some photos catch his eye, and he asks about them. Turns out, they are you fruity keelers! Ooh, I want to find out what's been happening with her! And another bit of foreshadowing. Yes, yes, they are really good. I'll wager her name will be known throughout the fleet soon. Why yes, yes it will. But not for the images, more for being a saint, a killer of demons, and defier of Horus, and agent of Malkador, and the Emperor. Yep, she'll be known alright. And then, He's a sycophant and easily swayed, says a voice in Fulgrim's head. I would have thought the influence of the blade would have been a bit more subtle than this. An influence, not a voice. Flat out saying, hey, this dude's an idiot. Do this about it. So, Eidolon is griping about being on a peace mission when he should be busting heads. The apothecary, Fabius, tells him that he's working on the gene seed modifications. And Eidolon immediately volunteers to be the guinea pig, because then he will be deadlier than ever. Well, that was an easy sell, so it's clear where he gets his weird fudgy voice thing from. And then, even more foreshadowing, the Astartes he has been experimenting on, well, Fabius has found a way to hotwire the nervous system, so that it links to the pleasure centers, meaning every incision and cut is ecstasy. Very Slanesh, very Hellraiser. So, Fulgrim is hearing voices, and he's not a psyker, so it's not that. So he concludes that it is his undiminished mind, or his subconscious, just flat out conversing with him. When Ferris's scout ships discover the solar connectors, he sets sail for them right away without consulting Fulgrim, and the voice says that this is a betrayal, and he'll have to be punished for it. Uh, I don't think this is in a dialogue, mate. I think you are misreading this. It is clearly an external presence acting on you. Okay, on board, things are on a roll. Everyone who went to the Lair Temple and saw all that magnificence is now kind of haunted by it. Not in a bad way, more an unsettling but inspirational way. The structures and images creeped people out but had a haunting beauty. So everyone is sculpting and painting and recording like mad. A bunch of them, including Astartes, have been going to this guy Evander Tobias, who was the greatest public speaker in the world. But then he got throat cancer and his greatest pupil, Cinderman. Nifty. Anyway, he's been counselling people who are haunted by the Laird. He talks about Cornelius Blake, this dude who was a genius, a heretic, a legend, and a threat, all in the same day. He believed that you need to go beyond the five senses to achieve the infinite, and you shouldn't be limited by the five senses. He indulged in scandalous behaviour for the time, but who knows what that means. I mean, elbows on the dinner table, or banging penguins, depending on the time period. Very well. If that's the way you want to play it, Rasputin, bring in the bucket of soapy frogs and remove his trousers. And yeah, thinking on that, remember Dogma, when uh, the angels are talking about what used to be a hell-worthy trespass. I remember when eating meat on a Friday was supposed to be a hell-worthy trespass. So, the Iron Hands go cruising into the Corona to take on the Diasporex. 
thousands of ships all unloading on each other. The Iron Hands have the upper hand, haha. <laughs> but then a main capital ship takes control of Imperial weapons and turns them on their fellows. Ferris sees this and immediately focuses fire on it to deal with this Xeno's tech before it does too much damage. The Diasporics are also at a disadvantage because they are a democracy. They have many captains, which means a lack of chain of command. Everyone is doing their own thing. The Imperial fleet acts as one under the command of one man, Ferris Manus. And so the Diasporics manage to create a gap and are trying to get the solar collectors out. And what do you know? The Emperor's children emerge to cut them off and cut them to pieces. So they've been finding all of these fine, awesome wells with all these weird grown things on them. They are just a little too perfect to be natural. And Fulgrim is moved to tears and they are actually just going to enter them in the records and move on, leaving these magnificent worlds untouched and unspoiled. The Eldar show up. Neither side trust each other enough to board the other's ship, so they go down onto the planet. Fulgrim meets with Eldrad of the Eldar and his forces. It's a tense exchange and they are probing each other checking out subtleties and such. Apparently, the Elder have been waiting on these worlds for eons, but then why are you still bumbling around in Craft World? Well, you won't like the answer. And he tells him that Horus is on the verge of death and that he has been turned and he'll betray the Emperor and lead his armies against him. Fulgrim does not take this slur against his beloved brother very well. And it's on! Fulgrim takes out their equivalent of a Dreadnought and the voice in his head tells him to remove the head. He does! and the soul is consumed, because Fulgrim knows this. His subconscious knows everything, apparently. So when the voice in his head tells him, well, that's the soul being eaten, well, of course, I must have known that all along. What a gimp. Anyway, I'm assuming the soul is consumed by some mesh. The Elder take the webway back to the craft world and everyone is aghast that this ancient entity has been killed and so they all pile back into the webway to get stuck in. There's what I thought was a description of a bloodthirster, but it's actually an avatar of Cain. The Elder's thirst for war made manifest. So, Fulgrim versus an Eldar god. It makes a massive lunge at him and he laughs it off, but the voice is like, Fool, you think Eldar trickery is so easily detected? Okay, Fulgrim, I know you've been telling yourself that this is your own subconscious having some banter with you, but your inner monologue is now literally warning you of things you aren't aware of. I really think you should cotton on to this being an external and likely malevolent influence. So the big fight is underway and Fulgrim comes up with a rather odd solution. He throws his sword in the air and the Avatar goes for it and not Fulgrim. So the Primarch takes advantage of this and jumps in and gives it a monster punch. Okay, you are facing an Eldar Avatar and it is more focused on your sword than on you. For a Primarch, Fulgrim is a bit of a thicky. So as he is fighting it, he gets miffed at its singular nature. All it knows is to fight and kill. Nothing of art and culture and pleasure. That'll serve you well under Slanesh there, Fulgrim. Hating corn will definitely make she who thirsts pat you on the head and go good boy. Anyways, in the defeat of the Avatar, he is exposed to the word Slanesh. And from the elation, his last bit of resistance to the sword crumbles and he promises that only through me will you achieve perfection. And so that's it. Fulgrim is now in the fold. The Diasporex have been utterly wiped out, the humans that were with them have been sent out into the Imperium to start new lives as Imperial flunkies. Serena has been sleeping with people and then offing them so she can finger paint in their body fluids. She's meeting with Lucius who is super pissed and mused that Loken cheated and punched me in my perfect face. She's all carved up already, so yep, your perfection is gone, deal with it. And he decides to embrace it, and uh, promptly carves up one side of his face, and then the other, as you do. Gotta be honest, I'm starting to get into this now. There's a definite vibe, like the influence of the sword, but all across the Emperor's children. Events are being manipulated, not the events themselves, but almost like the perception of them. Lucius getting his nose broken, and then, you know, well, obviously the solution is to slice yourself up like Mason Verger. Why wouldn't you?
So Fulgrim is in his quarters and the sword has now transformed into a painting and he has realised that it isn't his inner monologue, it's an outside presence. And someone from the Administratum comes in and informs him that something has happened to the Warmaster. It's taken long enough, but Fulgrim is now realising that the inner voice wasn't like the dark passenger in Dexter, but an actual foreign intellect. But apparently he's okay with it. The portrait is kind of Dorian Gray style, and it's of Fulgrim, obviously, and so it tells him that Horus has seen what's beyond, and that is why he's turning on the Emperor, because the Emperor is not perfect, and it can help Fulgrim towards that. I'm not a fan of the narrator's presentation of Fulgrim, with this crispy, wimpy perfection. I don't buy this as Fulgrim's voice. I know he is portrayed as kind of a fop, but when you see the images of the dude, he's fucking massive and ripped. I'd expect at least a little more hint of bass in that voice. And then we're back with Fabius, who is carving up someone else, looking at them like a butcher to a piece of meat, or a sculptor to a slab of stone. The subject asks if he can make him better, and he replies, you won't believe the things I can do for you. It's really accelerating now, and becoming more obvious. Fabius being seduced by his pleasure in experimenting, it's bloating. Again, Hannibal Lecter, the book he wrote on surgical addiction. Fabius is now also becoming addicted to the dicing and slicing. Plus, the drugs the Emperor's children are taking, the heightening of senses, it's making it tough for them to differentiate between good and bad sensations. They are just getting off on the intensity. Pain and pleasure, indivisible. The long warp voyage has bored Fulgrim stupid and he has been hoping for a disaster just to give him something to do, to occupy his senses. And when they drop out and see Horus's fleet, Fulgrim actually contemplates opening up on him. He has the dead bang and unawares. Has a hint of Fulgrim re-emerged because he's not wearing the sword anymore because he's out of its proximity? Maybe its influence has waned because of distance. If Horus has indeed turned on the Emperor, is this a hint of the Primarch, the loyal son he was? If he vaporizes Horus now, it ends the heresy. A firing solution now saves billions of lives and prevents a war. But then some flunky goes, Sir, you forgot this, and brings the sword. And this squashes Fulgrim's thoughts of doing the right thing. Probably for the best, because the heresy would have ended right here otherwise. The fleet tries to scatter and dozens of howls come pouring in. He answers the one from the vengeful spirit and laughs as he informs Horus that it seems he still has a few things to teach him. Fulgrim, Fabius, Tarvitz, Eidolon and Lucius all stroll down the umbilical to the doors to the vengeful spirit. Fulgrim notes that Lucius is all scarred up, freshly and self-inflicted. He makes a mental note to ask him about this later. Horus is waiting for them and is stoked to see Fulgrim, allaying his fears that Horus has turned traitor. What was I thinking? Horus is awesome. He'd never do such a thing. I wonder just how Horus is going to set him straight on this. But, okay, Horus just flat out spills the beans to Fulgrim. Again, it was Erebus in a Sejanus suit lying to you. I don't know, maybe there are external forces at work. Everyone else is enduring this slow seduction a bit of the time being worked on. And Horus just flips a switch from loyal to chaos-worshipping, dad-hating traitor. And credit to Fulgrim, he's holding out. He's got the greatest of the Primarchs, his brother, working on him. He's got the voice in his head going at it. He's got Erebus, and he's still staying loyal. So, the Emperor's children weeding out the loyalist. Well, it's real easy. Anyone not taking the new drugs, you're not one of us. Down to Istvan you go. You decline either option, get the fuck out, this isn't your place. Try downstairs at the Istvan Ballroom. There's a gathering there that's more your speed, fuddy daddy. So, I'm really getting into this book now. It took a while to really hook me. I had the same thing with The Great and Secret Show, a good opening, and then chapters of what the hell am I reading before it really started to pick up again. So all the soap opera stuff with the artists, it really set the scene without me knowing. All their envies and talents and friction and affairs between them, this weird little art community was slowly offering subtle hints that things were becoming more decadent and then more depraved. Like watching Colour Out of Space, things get weirder and weirder until you realise things have gone utterly batshit. So, 
The Iron Hands are on board and there's mention of them having saved Fulgrim's ass, but you don't bring up such things. Everyone knows Fulgrim throws a wobbler if you bring up anything he has done that wasn't flawless, so people just don't in order to avoid the aggro. Could this be the source of all this perfection? Fulgrim screws up all the time, but no one bothers calling him on it, lest he throw a temper tantrum. So Fulgrim literally wanders around with ultimate swagger because he has never messed up, ever. He is flawless, he is perfect, because see, no one has ever said otherwise. I think you're great, Charlie. Everything you do is art. You're a sex machine. Uh-huh. Get on the scene with sex machine. My brothers get admonished, and they mess up, but not me. Nope. You fuck up like everyone else does. We just don't want to listen to you whinge if we call you on it. So Ferris Manus is looking forward to seeing Fulgrim to heal any rifts that may have started to appear between them. You know what may put a spanner in that plan? Yeah. Hi, Horus has turned to chaos and is planning on killing Dad. We're about to kill half our legions and I've started worshipping Slanesh. How are you? And Ferris reacts as expected. He says he has no brother, and a full-on ruck ensues. He catches Fulgrim's sword in his hand and shatters it. Fulgrim snags the hammer and knocks him out and just leaves. The Phoenix Guard act as one and do a simultaneous denorganization of the Morlocks. Okay, so Ferris lives. We'll see how the others do. Everyone retreats to their ships and the Emperor's children open fire on the Iron Hands, but only cripple them, not kill them, and off to Istvan we go. The powerful storms kill a bunch of navigators and start to accelerate the corruption. The people on board start to get into the revelry, start to get more depraved. In fact, it's starting to feel like we're going event horizon here. Now let me show you. And the writings of Cornelius Blake from back earlier become required reading amongst the Emperor's children and also Fulgrim's reading list. Artwork of orgies, boozing and troughing. Fulgrim is getting tattoos and piercings and scarification. The influence of Slaanesh is really starting to show. Ostian de la Fleur is working on the statue of the Emperor and he's spending more time in his quarters because every time he steps out, it gets weirder. And he's had enough. Ferris is brooding over the betrayal and wants to be the first in to deal with Fulgrim personally. And he does make a good point here. What was it about him that Fulgrim saw? Why did he think he would flip? And if Fulgrim saw it, what if other Primarchs have as well? So he needs to prove that his loyalty is above reproach. So Ostian finally finishes his statue of the Emperor after months of work. He's about to step out. Fulgrim wanders in and goes on a rant that he should have made a statue of him and not the Emperor, and takes his sword and plunges it through Ostian and the statue, pinning him there by the chest. This was also probably inspired because earlier, Fulgrim had called him in to check out a sculpture he had done. Fulgrim had made these busts of all his captains and asked what he thought, and was told that they are too perfect. They were made with the head, not the heart. There's no passion, no flaws, no real beauty. Perfection is unattainable, so don't try it. If he tried to perfect his craft, he'd get nothing done. Very wabasabi, the celebration of flaws and things. This of course pisses Fulgrim right off and the dude realises then that he just wanted to have smoke blown up his ass. So he throws a pissy fit and promises to never pick up a chisel again. And so it seems suitably spiteful and fitting that he kills his critic by nailing him to a sculpture that makes his own effort look like, um, I don't know. It's like watching a bunch of retards trying to fuck a doorknob out there. Serena takes time off from painting in body fluids and goes to see the sculptor to apologise. Goes in, finds him dead, and pulls herself onto the point of the blade. And that's another character dead. Onto the statues of the heroes, the crew have started adding horns and boobs to them all. Okay, and then we are going to the big show. The one Bekwa Kinska has been working on ever since she was enamoured and inspired by the lair. Okay. Anyway. As soon as it begins, everyone erupts into an orgy of violence and lust, even the Astartes. Bequa is dancing around the stage, her limbs bending unnaturally as her bones break, and then it's clear she's dead. She's like a marionette. And the dancer transforms into a demonette, and from the description, it sounds like even the Astartes are getting wood. The orchestra are killed, and more demonettes appear, and Astartes rushes in and picks up one of the bizarre instruments created specifically for this performance and desperately tries to recreate the amazing music. Others quickly follow. Are these the first noise marines? 
Why, yes, they are. Marius builds a base tone that he fires into the crowd to create an explosion, and the others start perpetrating similar sonic carnage. Blasts of music take out balconies, and the whole place goes Hellraiser. <laughs> Then, Istvan. The battle begins and the Primarchs are islands amidst the sea of destruction, just demolishing everyone around them. Angron, Mortarian, Fulgrim isn't there yet, but his noise marines are. Ferris Manus, no one stands a chance against them, thousands dying every minute. And then we get the big duel 2.0 between Fulgrim and Manus, and while using the lair weapon, Fulgrim gets a moment of complete clarity when he is about to kill his brother. He sees how far he has fallen. The whole thing was a lie. He was a complete chump. He regrets it all, wishes he could take it back, but he has fallen too far and can't see a way out. Hmm, okay. I guess in for a penny, in for a pound, but I don't know if that applies to chaos. You know, maybe just try and turn back. But then the sword does a Stormbringer and takes control. Fulgrim tries to stop it, but the blade decapitates the Primarch of the Iron Hands which leads to some Highlander-style consequences of removing the head of an immortal, wind whipping around, the power of a Primarch unleashed, and fleeing his body. Only the entity that has been with him all this time protects Fulgrim from this supernatural wind. Fulgrim is overwhelmed with regret, and the presence spitefully drenches him in memories to remind him and affirm just how much of a dolt he was. It shows him where he had thought Ferris was arrogant, he was being heroic, the spiteful comments were just jests to deflate a Fulgrim's monstrous ego. Ferris was altruistic and just the best, and he has killed him. Not sure how Fulgrim is going to recover from this. I know he continued on the path and does all his Slaneshi stuff, but if Rylanor defying him in 10,000 years and holding out wounds his pride to an extent he'll never recover, how the hell is he going to deal with this? Anyway. The sword promises him oblivion, an escape from his guilt and sorrow, peace, which makes sense because it will grant him respite from his endless pursuit of perfection. Plus, he has been instrumental now in solidifying the death of the Emperor's dream, and his shame over that makes oblivion seem even more appealing. And so he accepts, and stops resisting the entity, and realises he has made an even bigger mistake. The entity enters his body, forcing his consciousness into the dark recesses of his own mind. The beast takes control of his body. Hmm, okay, I don't know if this is a Primark thing, or a singular or rare occurrence, or if the law has been changed, but in Realms of Chaos, I think this was a scenario. Your allegiance to the ruinous power, your shadow self drifts deeper into the storm that is the deity, and you becoming a demon prince, well, you are still you, just invigorated and reborn and reformed into the immortal state. Weird that here you are crammed into a corner, a prisoner in your own mind as a demon comes in and takes control. So what's the difference between a demon prince and a possessee? They are both a body that just gets mutated with a demon at the controls. Does one destroy your soul and the other just parcels it up in the corner for later? Is it because Fulgrim has turned away, so his dedication to Sladesh isn't strong enough to actually earn him Demon Prince status, but his Primarch body is just too tempting to waste, so Slanesh just swaps out drivers? Sort of an Exorcist 3 scenario, where Damien Karras didn't turn to the demon, fought the possession, and threw himself down the steps to deal with it. Satan was not pleased and so swapped out Damien with the Zodiac Killer, leaving a friendly entity to drive around in Damien's body doing the Devil's Mission. But in 10,000 years, Rylanor still upsets Fulgrim. So it has his memories. Why would the demon give a shit what Rylanor thinks of him? Is it just mimicking him? I guess I'll have to wait and see, or I could go and look it up. Once the massacre is over and the ashes of the fallen are raining down like confetti, there's a big honking parade. They burn the Eye of Horus into a hillside, he gives a big rousing speech, onwards to terror. There are those followers of the Emperor that are deluded, and there is more blood to be spilled, ours and theirs. The galaxy is our prize, who is with me? And everyone is all, hell yeah! Afterwards, Horus is in his quarters, wondering if things are progressing too fast, whether he can keep reins on this juggernaut he has set in motion. His mood sours as Fulgrim shows up, 
He laments that they used to be so close, that he was an exemplary warrior, always seeking perfection, always trying to accomplish without flaw or failure, calculating, and now he just seems to revel in the adrenaline rush of fighting and slaughter. And as they talk, Horus starts to detect something amiss, because they have been so close for so long that there are subtle hints that something ain't quite right. Fulgrim removes the head of Ferris Manus from a box and for some reason he has removed the eyes, you know, as one does, and tosses it on the floor as tribute to the War Master. Then there's this word insouciant, which I'd never heard before, so I had to look it up. It means showing a casual lack of concern, indifference. And then Horus recognises the tone. He's encountered it before. It was when he was chatting with that Sarkel spirit and brokering the deal, so he reckons that there may be something similar operating his brother. There's something infinitely dark and full of malice in there, and Horus confronts him on that, and it quite honestly just confirms it. Horus warns it that he is no weakling like Fulgrim, so if you want to throw down, I'll break you, and he fires up his lightning claws as a warning. Nonplussed, or rather insouciant, eh, eh? the demon just goes and pours some wine and says it is here to pledge allegiance to him, not fight him, and lets him know that if it wasn't for him, Fulgrim would have run straight to the Emperor, that he has been working on him every second of every day for ages now to get this result. Damn, that has to suck for Horus. He must have thought it was his charisma, the strength of his message, the righteousness of his cause that has been swaying everybody. Now he is finding out that, nope, dude, you were boring and lame. The only reason people have been swayed is because we have all these agents corrupting them. Otherwise, they'd never buy a thing you're selling. You are a smooth talker. You are. You are. Right. Horus, you are being played, mate. Primarchs that joined your calls, turns out they are being duped. What do you think that means for you? Colossal cons are being revealed, tricks and treachery to ensure people follow you. Maybe rethink your swift devouring of that pile of bullshit that was the Emperor is going to portray you to become a god thing. Nah, it's everyone else who is weak and has been conned, not me. I'm the only one that is actually in the right. And then a creepy moment as the thing airs its admiration for this new body. But of course, it'll have to make some modifications. If Fulgrim ever gets free, he's gonna have a shock. Uh, didn't I used to have legs? And where the hell did all these arms come from? Horus, dude, wake the fuck up. It is so obvious that everyone around you is only on your side because of lies. Doesn't that tell you something about the honesty of your purpose? And then Horus has to conceal his disgust as he asks as to where Fulgrim is, and is told that he's in here, although I can't imagine he's happy pushed into the dark corners of his mind, and that he'll never get tired of their conversations. Horus says you have his body, let him die, but the demon is all, oh hell no, I'm having way too much fun tormenting it. This is really brutal. Fulgrim was just kind of being swindled, but when it came to it, he couldn't kill Ferris. He couldn't turn full traitor. And when the sword killed him, it exploited his profound and absolute grief to trick him into giving up his body to escape this guilt and condemn him to this terrible fate. So Horus has to play along with the charade, because if it comes out that this isn't Fulgrim, but rather a demon controlling him, well, you can kiss goodbye to having the Emperor's children on your side. So, you can have Fulgrim for now. Really? Does Horus think he can resolve this? Once he has defeated the Emperor, he can be all like, hey, you demon, out! You had your fun, but time to go. And how would that shake out? I mean, suddenly to have Fulgrim back behind the wheel and the chaos sodden Horus is standing there with the Emperor dead. Who knows how many other Primarchs will also be dead and there's demons a go-go. Not sure he'd be, hey, Horus, I see you've been busy while I've been gone. Wanna tell me about it? So Fulgrim gives this over the top bow that reminds me of the full rimmer from Red Wolf and Horus vows to free his brother as soon as possible because no one deserves such a hideous fate. This is getting a lot more complicated than I'd have thought. I only knew the broad strokes. I didn't know that this situation was this tricky. I thought Fulgrim went Slanesh, not that he was tripped, that loyalist Fulgrim is in there. And if the demon gets the boot, aware of the trick of the lies of being conned, Fulgrim would be like super loyalist now? He'd be an untouchable Primarch. He'd question even the most trivial thing as a possible source of corruption. Christ, he'd be like the Primarch for the Sisters of Battle, utterly intolerant of any hint of wavering fealty, utterly fanatic. Anywho, Mars has fallen to the War Master and a demon is wandering around taking in the sights and it comes across the statue and is all, hmm, don't recall there being two bodies on the sword, but whatever. 
So, the Laird had caught a fraction of the demon's essence in the sword, so when Fulgrim was wielding it, the sword was the lens through which it could focus its influence and pour it into him. Lucius might know this, so he is giving the sword to him to distract him, not to seduce him to Slaanesh, he is already well underway on that particular path, but rather to stop him pondering if Fulgrim is still inside. Because the Emperor's children not only look up to their Primarch as a father figure, but as an example to strive towards, an inspiration. And if the demon gets discovered, even the corrupted legion will turn on it. So, it needs to keep Lucius preoccupied, and the sword will be a way to do that. Okay, a sad, tragic ending. A little Hellraiser-esque, like when Pinhead and the Cenobites remember that they used to be human, and see what they have become. The awesome Emperor's children is just going to fall into ruin as they follow their demon Primarch, and like it did with Fulgrim, the demon will trick them and connive and deceive and push them into this awful fate by exploiting their loyalty and devotion. Grimdark indeed. We'll see what happens next.